Hey guys, it's Coach Goodrich again. Uh, this is another video lecture uh, for American history. This is for my eighth grade American history class. This is part B of Unit 9 America and World War One. So make sure you got your notes out and you're following along with that. Um, so we talked about previously the underlying long term causes of the war and then the short term or immediate causes of the war. Um, long term causes war, violation of mutual rights by Germany, specifically um, the Zimmerman note, Woodrow Wilson's idealism, and German balance of power, the European balance of power, really, on, even beyond that. Now we're going to start talking about, and then your short-term cause was the sinking of the four unarmed American ships between March 12th and 17th in, 19, in 1917, which is going to prompt the United States to formally join the fighting effort. Um, now we're actually going to talk about what that looks like when they started fighting. So your American military participation. So you got naval, army, or the Navy, army, and what is going to become the Air Force, but not technically yet. So American naval forces, patrol in the North Sea. This is the North Sea right here. Got to find ways to get from the United States over to the United Kingdom and from the United Kingdom to give supplies to the soldiers in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, in this region that are fighting. A lot of U-boats in this area. One of the ways that we're able to do that safely is by developing the convoy system. So you have a lot of groups or a lot of ships traveling at one time, confuses the enemy, not sure which one is most important, carrying the most vital supplies or information. Um, also kind of scares people away. So you got a lot of safety in numbers with the convoy system. Number two, uh, the Army, the American Expeditionary Force, it was called uh, the AEF, led by this man right here, uh, General John J. Pershing, known as Blackjack. Um, he bears a distinction of being the highest, uh, the, the general uh, with the highest military ranking ever given. It's only been given to two people, general of the armies, um, him and George Washington, posthumously, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, the American soldiers are going to be called Doughboys. This dates back to the um, the Mexican-American War, uh, where the soldiers walking around in the deserts of the American Southwest of Mexico are going to be covered with sweat, and eventually, like the terrain, the sandy, dirt, gravelly terrain is going to cover them and kind of give them like a doughy complexion. Uh, so that is a nickname that they're going to wear for a long time. Pictures from Chateau Thierry. You're going to see a lot of trenches, a lot of uh, exploded buildings. A lot of munitions in here. Some of the pictures are going to be kind of gross, so we're going to kind of go through them. Um, if you want to go back and watch it again, you definitely can. Um, San Mihel, uh, Germany being pushed back to the German border. Um, see some of the British soldiers in gas masks, some of the early tanks. The last major battle of the war, at least for the Americans, was the Battle of the Meuse Argonne. Um, it's going to feature, mo most famously, this guy, Alvin York. Alvin York is going to grow up in the middle of nowhere in the backwoods of Tennessee. He is going to be a wild child, heavy gambler, heavily drinker, fighter, uh, duelist, like just basically just all around like wild man. Um, but he's going to have a conversion experience. He's going to come to know uh, the Lord. Uh, he's going to join some fundamentalist um, backwoods church. And he's going to start off after getting drafted for the U.S. military as a conscientious objector, which means that he does not believe in fighting, does not believe in violence, does not believe in killing at all. Um, however, he is going to end up being the major hero of this battle. Um, and I don't want to get too much into it uh, because I want you guys to read through his story here in a couple of days. Um, it's pretty remarkable. So just remember that name, Alvin York. He had a rough day. Uh, some of the early uh, technologies used in this war, you got howitzers, which is basically big cannons, some tanks, machine guns, German stick grenades, American frag grenades. And um, this is the last major war that is going to use horses in any capacity, whether for combat or for supplies. Um, horses versus machine guns and grenades doesn't, doesn't usually end very well for the horse. Um, more pictures. From the combat, got a lot of pictures. This is one of the first wars we actually have like actual photog like people from the media taking pictures of things. So um, we have a lot more pictures from now on in these units. Kind of gloomy. Like I said, you see the destruction. Life in the trench is not so great. And then crossing over no man's land. Um, no wonder so many of these soldiers suffered from trench madness or uh, shell shock, which we now call PTSD. See the first of the planes that are going to be used for fighting. 
some of the gas burns, some mortar shells, more horses. So we talked about the Navy, talked about the Army, now we got American Air Power. Now, like I said, Air, the Air Force did not officially become its own military branch until after uh, World War II. So it's still part of the Army. The most famous American ace that we're calling, the best pilot, was a guy named Eddie Rickenbacker. Um, he had 26 kills over the course of the 18 months of the fighting, which was by far the most for any American pilot. So, I look at his plane. Now the most, and probably the best pilot, definitely the most lethal pilot, was a German uh, nicknamed the Red Baron, uh, Manfred von Richthofen, also known as the Red Knight and the Hun in the Sun. Um, to give you a little bit of, of, I guess a weird connection between this guy and Rickenbacker. Rickenbacker's got 26 kills throughout the course of the war. Ricked off in his 21 kills in one day. So that kind of puts into perspective um, how much better of a pilot he was than anybody else. I think he had close to like 80 kills throughout the course of the war. Um, however, the Red Baron is going to meet his end on April 21st, 1918, and he's going to be shot down by another, uh, another pilot, Canadian pilot, Roy Brown. You see the machine gun mounts. They had to figure out a way to synchronize the repeller spinning um, in front of it um, so the gun would not shoot bullets through the propeller because that would end up really badly. And obviously this is a Nazi plane. This is not from this time period, but it gives you an idea of what the plane looked like. So your final surrender for the Germans, the last group to kind of surrender, was on November 11th, 1918. That was when the... Um, Yes, when the Central Powers officially acknowledged the end of the war, the armistice is signed. Um, most famously, it's remembered 11-11-11-1918. 11, 11, 11, At the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, the war comes to an end. Or at least the fighting comes to an end. Now, we talked about American involvement abroad. Let's talk about how the war changed things and progressed society at home. So you got lots of different industries boards are going to get started um, thanks to Woodrow Wilson getting getting things going. Um, in order to win a war, you got to have supplies. This guy, Bernard Baruch, affectionately nicknamed Dr. Fax, is going to be appointed head of the War Industries Board by Woodrow Wilson. His job is going to be to turn America into one big factory so that they can carry on this war in the best way possible. They can arm themselves, they can arm their allies, they have all the supplies that they need. Um, and they're going to build all of it here. Um, it was tremendous for the American economy, really super powered, supercharged our economy. Another important character from this time was a guy named Herbert Hoover. He's going to be appointed head of the U.S. Food Administration. Um, because he had so many soldiers um, for the Allies that were fighting so far away, he had to come up with a system of rationing, uh, which means just not eating as much as what you used to or not eating certain things so that they could be sent abroad in order to feed the troops and feed the people whose houses and lives have been destroyed in Europe. Um, so you got things like Meatless Tuesdays, Wheatless Wednesdays, the Gospel of the Clean Plate, make sure you finish everything in your plate. And then a lot of private citizens started victory gardens, which were like little vegetable and herb gardens in their backyards, um, so that they could continue to uh, grow food for themselves and maybe give away what was left over to people that needed it. Um, also, you're going to put very strict restrictions and rationing on sugar. Um, famously, Herbert Hoover says, if you have a sweet tooth, pull it. Uh, women have to work because the men are going to be off fighting. Um, this is going to help to kickstart the idea of gender equality. Not long before this, you're going to have the passage of the 19th Amendment, which is going to give women the right to vote, finally. Um, and now you have, with every all these soldiers off fighting in different parts of of the world, uh, people have to take their jobs, especially with as much military supplies as we were trying to make. So women by the hundreds of thousands joined the workforce formally. This is kind of going to be repeated um, during World War II as well. The wars are expensive. In order to finance the war, um, the government started uh, the federal income tax, uh, which is something that not a whole lot of people enjoy today with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, 
taking a little bit of your paycheck every couple weeks or every month in order to pay for things in the government. Um, also, you're going to have like war fundraising um, through bonds. Bonds are like stocks in the military, stocks in the government that, pe that uh, government officials would sell and then buy back um, in order to raise money here now for uh, fighting for weapons, for supplies, and to feed the troops. Some other ones. Uh, the U.S. Fuel Administration is going to come up with two different ideas. I mean, if you're going to transport people back and forth across an ocean and give, give them the ability to move their tanks around when they get over to Europe, you're going to need to send over a lot of fuel. Those things are not cheap. Um, so in order to conserve the amount of light that was going to be needed, um, we turned to an idea that was first come up with by Benjamin Franklin, Daylight Savings. Um, which we just had, and then gasless Sundays. No driving, no turning on your gas stove. Um, save that fuel so we can send more of it to our allies in Europe. The Committee on Public Information um, was basically wartime propaganda to make the war popular. It was led by this man here named George Creel. 75,000 men spread the word. They gave 7.5 million speeches. A lot of them were known as the four-minute men. They got up and they spoke for about four minutes and they were done. Some of the ideas or some of the examples of um, some propaganda. This is going to lead to a lot of anti German immigrant hysteria. Orchestras are going to refuse to play uh, any of the famous German composers Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, Brahms. Uh, German measles, which was a disease back then, is going to be renamed Liberty Measles. Hamburger named after the town of Hamburg in Germany, is going to be renamed Salisbury Steak. Sauerkraut uh, comes from Germany, is going to be renamed Liberty Cabbage. And Dachshunds, little wiener dogs, are going to be nicknamed, or nicknamed uh, renamed, I should say, Liberty Pups. One of the more unpopular ideas that Woodrow Wilson implemented was the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Um, it was a $10,000 fine or 20 years in jail for interfering with your draft. Uh, status or being what they would term disloyal or abusive to the government, uh, which sounds kind of similar to what John Adams tried to do with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, 150 years before this, uh, kind of an abuse of government power. It was not well received. So at the end of this, in order to formally end the war, uh, Wilson is going to come up with his 14 points um, that it's going to try to get inserted into the Treaty of Versailles. Um, his far-reaching idea was to end war forever. So you have an end to secret diplomacy, freedom of the seas, reduction of trade barriers among the nations of the world, reduced tariffs, which are taxes on import and export of goods, the global reduction of armaments or weapons, the adjustment of colonial claims basically take away the empires, um, and then number six, really his last point, if this is a, obviously a shortened version of that, there's not 14 points here, but his last point uh, was the League of Nations. He wanted a group of people, of ambassadors to come together so they could stop conflict before it formally got started. So you got the big four in the Treaty of Versailles, the big four in order. United States, Woodrow Wilson, Great Britain, David Lloyd George, France with George Clemenceau, in Italy was Vittorio Orlando. He presents his 14 points, codenamed Peace Without Victory. Lloyd George rejects his 14 points. He demands heavy reparations, heavy payments from Germany to the tune of $33 billion, of which a grand total of zero is going to be paid. Clemenceau does not want Germany to invade France again because they have a habit of doing that. Um, he's only interested in getting the Alsace-Lorraine territory as a buffer zone and forming what is called the Maginot Line, which is an underground line of tunnels and walls and uh, bunkers. And then Orlando comes to secure lands for Italy. Not really sure how this guy got invited because um, he started off fighting for the other side. The treaty itself, Germany was to pay reparations. This is June 1919. Germany, German colonies would be divided. New nations were to be created. Um, League of Nations was going to be started, but the U.S. will not join or reject the treaty three times, and we go back to our idea of isolationism. Um, Wilson suffers a stroke shortly after this, and that is what the world looks like afterwards. I appreciate it, you guys. We are on to part three. Make sure you got that. If you need to go back and rewatch anything, please go ahead and do so. And um, 